most of them will vent to hot springs on the ocean floor. So a little bit like the geysers you see in Yellowstone National Park, but at the bottom of the ocean. It's where hot mineral rich fluid gushes out of the ocean crust. So we find them wherever there's volcanic activity. A lot of them are along what we call the mid-ocean ridge, and that's where the huge plates of the ocean crust are rifting apart and lava is erupting basically to fill the gap between them as they move apart. They move apart very slowly, and typically about the sort of rate our, our fingernails grow. So we find hydrothermal vents dotted along that rift that runs all the way around the middle of the oceans. But we also get them on other undersea volcanoes. They were first discovered in late 1970s in the Eastern Pacific. Since then, more than 200 have been seen on the deep sea floor, and we've detected signs of at least 500 sets of deep sea vents. They chuck out a plume of mineral-rich uh, fluid that's different to seawater, and we can detect that with something a bit like an underwater smoke detector. And we still have a lot of deep ocean to explore, so undoubtedly there will be a lot more uh, out there. Well, these deep sea vents are an important part of, of how our planet works. They're the end product of seawater circulating in new crust that's been formed by volcanic activity at the ocean floor. Now, I'm a marine biologist, and why I'm excited about deep sea vents is that they support colonies of deep sea creatures in an otherwise quite sparsely populated abyss. We get these rich oases of populations of deep sea creatures thriving around deep sea vents because the mineral-rich fluid gushing out of the vents is an energy source um, for microbes. Deep sea vents, to me, are just like islands, the little islands of life. More than 400 new species of animals have been described formally, uh, and their descriptions published in, in the scientific literature. Uh, that's actually, that 400, that's to 2006. <laughs> uh, if you do the sums, I think that's on average about one every, well, at least one a month, at least one new animal species a month. So I've been working at uh, one location, uh, one, one of several locations called the Cayman Trough, which is in the Caribbean, just south of the Cayman Islands, where there is a very deep bit of volcanic rift on the ocean floor. It's actually possibly the Earth's deepest undersea volcanic rift. And in June last year, uh, I was invited to take part in a Japanese expedition, having had several UK expeditions out there where we mapped the site so we know what's where. Here was an opportunity to actually take part in the first manned missions uh, to these vents. One of the sets of vents we found in the Cayman Trough, two that we've discovered, is the world's deepest um, known so far. It's just about 5,000 metres deep, that's 3.1 miles deep. And there are very few vehicles that can carry people to that depth. Uh, so it was a really uh, exciting opportunity to take part in this uh, expedition uh, led by our Japanese colleagues. Although the porthole is tiny and you can only see where the light is, this is an incredibly wide angle camera, <laughs> if you like our, our eyes. And you do get this wider perspective of what the environment is like, and particularly the patchiness. That's something that's always struck me. And that actually is a reflection of the very great patchiness in environmental conditions. Temperature varies by, can vary by hundreds of degrees over tens of centimetres, and, and the life also reflects that. Visiting and being able to see with your own eyes, yeah, really gives you an important, I think, perspective to, to, to really formulate your ideas about what's going on in, in these environments. are one of several places in the deep ocean where there's now interest in mineral resources uh, on the deep sea floor. At deep sea vents, the, the spectacular mineral chimneys that build up as the hot fluids gushing out of the seabed, very, very rich in copper, uh, zinc, iron, gold. If they sit around on the seafloor for long enough, maybe uranium as well that they can leach from seawater. Commodity prices have increased because our use of these sorts of resources has increased, partly with new technology, 
also with global population growth, you know, we're now at 7 billion people. At the same time, we're more used now to working on the seafloor. We've seen extraction of oil and gas from deeper waters over the years. And that kind of technology, that kind of know-how can now be applied to the machinery required uh, for mining on the ocean floor. So one of the questions about who owns what in the deep ocean, that there's kind of an underwater land grab going on at the moment that in some ways is redrawing our geopolitical map with territory beneath the waves. So what happens is you automatically get, under the UN Convention Law of the Sea, you get 200 nautical miles around your coastline. And that's any coastline, the coastline of any speck of land that is your territory. So a lot of our island overseas territories, now we get 200 nautical miles around them. So let's take the, the Atlantic, uh, just as an example of how the seafloor is now effectively parceled up for its resources. We have a bit of mid-ocean ridge in the uh, Atlantic around Ascension Island. OK, we've got 200 nautical miles. And then if you can actually show scientifically that geologically more of the seafloor is still connected to your continental shelf region, you can claim a little bit more if the UN approves it. So we've also we've got our 200 nautical miles and we've claimed a little bit more that's currently pending. We have to hand in the evidence and have it assessed. So there's a bit of UK uh, there. Then Brazil has a couple of little islands near the Mid-Ocean Ridge, St. Peter and St. Paul Rocks, and they get 200 nautical miles around those in that area there. Uh, and then in international waters, um, countries can sponsor uh, the application by a contractor, which could be a company, it could be a research institution, uh, to basically do the mineral exploration for the mineral resources of deep sea vents. And you get kind of a thousand kilometers of Mid-Ocean Ridge in a block. So Russia has a big section of Mid-Ocean Ridge about here. Immediately above it, France has got a section of Mid-Ocean Ridge where it's got a, a, a mining exploration license. Then we get up towards the Azores, which of course belong to Portugal. And so 200 nautical miles around the Azores and Portugal is then arguing that a big section of Mid-Ocean Ridge north and south of that 200 mi um, nautical mile boundary is connected and should be theirs as well. So there's a big chunk that's Portuguese. Then there's a gap and then Iceland is doing the same. Iceland gets its 200 nautical miles and is then claiming a connection uh, as well. But an awful lot of the Mid-Ocean Ridge in the Mid-Atlantic is now already effectively parceled up in terms of the rights to the minerals at the deep sea vents. And that's happened just in the past couple of years and it's happened without most of us being aware that this is going on. That's just the Atlantic. It's also happening in the Indian Ocean uh, and elsewhere. So what's the impact of mining a deep sea vent? Well, what will happen is you, with whatever machinery, someone will go down and they will scrape up all the chimneys, bring them to the surface, extract the metals. So what will happen is all of the chimneys will be removed. All of the marine life living on the chimneys will be wiped out by that process and the seafloor will be scraped back to effectively a crack with the hot fluid gushing out of it. But that's how that deep sea vent started. Deep sea vents don't last forever. They open up and shut down naturally. And so a lot of people have said, well, mining simulates a natural disturbance process. And to an extent it does. But what matters is the rate at which we do it when we're mining compared with that natural rate of disturbance. Along these slow spreading ridges, that resetting of vents, they shut down, everything dies off and so on, they start up again, maybe once every 4,000 years. Okay, so that's the natural rate of this disturbance occurring to which the marine life is adapted. If we come along and we're knocking them back to time zero every 10, 20, 30 years across a whole region, we're doing that at a much, much greater rate than that natural disturbance. And that may well have an impact. That may well mean that populations are no longer connected. Um, our sort of web of life could break down. We could see loss of species from the system. Now, there is an alternative path open to us at this point to consider. And that is that for every set of active deep sea vents, where we've got the hot fluid coming out and we've got the colony of marine life, there are probably about 10 vents that have shut down. The marine life, as far as we're aware, the specialist marine life has moved on but the mineral deposit is still exposed, accessible at the seafloor. These are what we call inactive vents. Now, potentially those could be mined without the same kinds of impacts that we've just been talking about. Uh, and if uh, contractors were encouraged or rather required to only mine inactive sites, uh, then I think that would buy us time to understand how these systems work. Because at the moment, the, the impacts are largely unknown. We simply don't know what will happen. At the heart of all this really is a question about 
who owns the deep ocean and what does ownership mean? Now, the deep ocean in international waters is defined in law as the common heritage of mankind. The moon is still common heritage of mankind. Antarctica is common heritage of, of mankind. And of course, we've approached Antarctica in a completely different way. You know, we have deliberately put, put the brakes on exploiting its resources for at least 50 years through the Antarctic Treaty, where we carry on doing science. Um, we have gone down a different path uh, with the deep ocean. Quite where that is going to take us is going to depend on us all thinking about our use of resources uh, because we all like the modern technology. That's what's creating the demand here. That's what's creating this potential future for the deep ocean. We all have to reflect on that more widely, I think, and choose the path ahead that we want.